just walking into the expo on Hurricane Ready. Find it very interesting. You can pick up nice little things and, and reading material. Here we go, June to December, so be careful. Clean out your carports. They're not open garages. You don't want any problems with neighbors, things flying around. Take care of our cute little city. I'm from Dania Beach in the estates of Fort Lauderdale at Dania Beach. And I love it here. The expo is, is very educational. There's all kinds of vendors here with information, reading material. Then we have a guest speaker, meteorologist. It's just very educational. And in fact, I think we're getting a little free ice cream too. Hi everybody, Randy Shane, Greater Dania Beach Chamber of Commerce here with our fifth annual Hurricane Expo Code Red event. Thank you to all our sponsors and vendors. Really important for the citizens and businesses in Dania Beach to be prepared. I know that our PIO Katia last year put all our information right after Hurricane Irma and it was a great assist to all our residents. So come out if you missed us this year, be sure to come next year. It's usually the first weekend, Saturday in June. Um, a lot of great vendors, a lot of great giveaways, and always food and ice cream from Jackson's. Hi, my name is Steve McLaughlin. I'm a meteorologist with NBC6, and I'm here at the Expo today. Uh, I'm actually really privileged and honored that I was asked to do this. Obviously, we live in Florida, and Florida is surrounded by water, and starting on June 1st, and even before June 1st, hurricanes are everything. Uh, we had the 25th anniversary of Andrew last year, and we've been very fortunate over the last 25 years, but as we learned last September with Hurricane Irma, uh, we are in a very vulnerable area, so expos like this and education are incredibly important, more than probably any other part of the country when it comes to hurricanes. I'm originally from North Jersey, just outside of New York City. Uh, I've been in Florida for a little over a year, uh, I came just in time for last year's crazy hurricane season, including here in South Florida. As a meteorologist, I am so fascinated with hurricanes. When they form out in the ocean, meteorologically they are beautiful. Um, they're also, in a way, easy to talk about to viewers. It's very easy to see a hurricane. It's very easy to see an eye, to see where it's moving, to understand what it is. You're not dealing with snow, you're not figuring out how many inches of snow, you're just trying to figure out how close is this storm going to get to me and then what are the local impacts. I'm also fascinated with what happens when the storm gets close and now you have to start talking about local ocean rise or flooding or tornadoes so you've gone from this big giant storm to a very local thing um, but you can't start doing the local thing until the storm gets close enough and that kind of fascinates me. I think the most important thing about hurricanes in South Florida is you should be prepared months and not days before a hurricane approaches. If you wait till the last minute, sometimes gas is gone, sometimes you can't evacuate, sometimes it's too late to leave your home, or if you do leave your home, it's really dangerous. Um, the bottom line is have lots of batteries for everything in your house for your iPhone, for your iPad, because that's gonna be the easiest way to keep in touch with people. Uh, do all your preparations before the hurricane, your food and your water. Um, and most importantly, listen to officials when they tell you to evacuate. Because even a mandatory evacuation, technically you cannot be forced to leave your home. So when people tell you to leave your home, it's because they wanna keep you safe and they don't wanna to have to go in and risk their lives trying to save you because you didn't listen to the advice that they gave you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited and uh, it's really a privilege. I know Brian Norcross spoke last year, so I have uh, big shoes to fill. I'm with the Humane Society of Broward County. Today we are here to give out information regarding our pet-friendly shelters. Not only is it important to prepare your homes and yourselves and your vehicles for an oncoming hurricane, but more importantly is to prepare your animals, and they do require a lot of preparation. You can go to our website, www.humanebroward.com, or to the website for the American Red Cross to find out about a pet-friendly shelter. Please remember that when you're preparing for your animal to go to a shelter, that you will re be responsible for all of the animal supplies and you will be able to spend your time with the animal the entire time. Please remember your little fuzzy friends, never leave them home alone. And if you have any questions about anything, 
please remember that you can come see us at the Humane Society of Broward County and give us a call. Hurricane Irma was a game changer for a lot of places, including America and Puerto Rico, um, Florida and Puerto Rico. And uh, what has happened actually is we now seem to have more pet friendly shelters available. So how the Humane Society is not in charge um, of registering animals or uh, anything like that. You don't have to do it in advance. If you decide you want to evacuate with your animal, please find a pet friendly shelter and um, you can go there and make sure that you bring all the pets important papers as well as any supplies that you need for that pet. And uh, so that was a good thing from Hurricane Irma. Please remember that there will not be a vet staff available to assist you with your animals, so please also prepare any necessary medicines. Again, please never, never leave your uh, animal at home unattended. And please, if you have to evacuate, don't feel that you cannot evacuate because you have an animal. You do have the option of pet-friendly shelters here in South Florida at this time. So please never leave your house alone. Never stay in an, uh, a dangerous situation. And, and I'm unfortunately a culprit of that because I live the fourth house off the Intracoastal. And we've been here 22 years. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to evacuate. We're worried about what to do with the animals. And we have a lot yeah. of animals, so how do you manage that many between two people? This is the second time that I've been to the Hurricane Expo, or maybe even more, but the second that I remember. And I feel it's a great expo because this information does need to be readily available to the public. Um, I've been here in South Florida for 48 years through many, many, many a storm. And they didn't used to have these expos available to people. You just, you know, you got maybe a magazine from Publix or a supermarket, or maybe you watch one of the local televised news stations. Here you can come and get information not only about prepping, but post hurricane. What can you do if your house is damaged? Um, how can you prepare your house, like windproof, windows, all sorts of information, how to get in, um, get your phone set up to receive emergency broadcasting, um, how to prep special needs if you are handicapped in a way or have a special medical need. You can find all those pertinent questions here. And if they don't have the answer here, they, they are able to direct you to somebody who does. So this expo is very, very necessary. And I think not only residents of Dania Beach should come, I think everybody should come. <laughs> even if they have to travel a little bit. I'm Robert Moyeta. I'm with the National Weather Service in Miami. We serve all of South Florida by providing weather forecasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, rain or shine. We also uh, communicate with uh, all the local officials here in Dania Beach and all across South Florida whenever there's uh, big weather uh, events threatening us or approaching us, for example, like Hurricane Irma. Uh, we were in frequent contact with the, all the city and county officials to provide the weather information necessary for really for the city and for the county to take the appropriate actions that were that had to be taken in advance of Hurricane Irma. So we're we're very, very happy to be here at uh, Dany Beach today for the Hurricane Expo. Uh, this is a great event where we get to interact with the public. We get the, to pass out our information, but also it's really important, at least for me, to hear from 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 people hear their experiences, hear are some of the things that they did to get ready for hurricanes last year. Uh, for example, like with Hurricane Irma. Uh, and because from those experiences, we can learn from those and apply them to this year, get ready for this year and any other year. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully it'll be a very quiet hurricane season for us here in South Florida, but we have to be ready every year because we are in one of the more hurricane prone parts of the country here. Three things that people should do, or th three things, uh, three points of advice for me is first, number one, at the top of the list, be ready, be, be prepared. Don't wait until a hurricane is three or four days away or less to get ready. Make sure you have your hurricane supplies now. You know, the reason we're having this event on June 2nd and not on you know, September 2nd is because we want people to be ready well before hurricanes threaten us. So have a plan, have a hurricane plan. That's number one. Number two, remain informed throughout the season. It doesn't mean that you have to worry every single day, but certainly just stay informed of the weather patterns and what's going on in the tropics throughout the year. And number three, Get your weather information from official sources. That means, of course, the National Weather Service. That means the city of Dania Beach and the county, Broward County, and also local media. 
you know, those are your official sources of hurricane and really weather information in general. So when a hurricane threatens, there's a lot of information out there that people are sharing. A lot of it is very good. Some of it, maybe not so good. So make sure that you're getting your information from official local sources so that, so that you can remain informed and make the right decisions. I want to thank the city of Daney Beach for having the National Weather Service and me here today uh, to speak and also to, uh, to pass out information to, uh, to everyone. And um, again, be ready. This is the time to get ready. Have a hurricane plan. And let's hope for a nice, quiet hurricane season. My name is Colin Donnelly. I'm the assistant city manager in Daney Beach. And um, what we've been doing here today is uh, encouraging our residents and visitors uh, and guests to sign up for the city's code red system, which is a, uh, which is a, um, a resident alert system that will allow us uh, to directly contact residents in the event of an emergency or for uh, more common matters, uh, special meetings or even something uh, like a water leak or a water, water line break in their neighborhood. Code reds allow us to speak directly to uh, a resident's cell phone or text message. Uh, it's an important tool. However, our residents have to sign in and sign up on our website and go to Code Red. Um, that's the best way for us to reach out to our residents. Um, and today we're giving out a, uh, a flashlight that's got a um, transistor radio in it. So during, so during storm season, um, it may be your last uh, best way to get information and to stay tuned. I live alone. And so I basically really depend on those uh, information that the city sends out on, over the phone. And we really were updated uh, with, those, uh, with the alerts. So yeah, I think it did great. Keep up the good work. But that we shouldn't let the, our guard down because uh, it's the water is what will do you in. It's not the wind necessarily, it's the water. So, and you know, we're in a flooded air, flooding area here in Dania. So I uh, got to look out for that. And we're with Florida Professional Law Group. We are an insurance litigation firm who helps homeowners against their insurance companies. We're here today because we want to talk about a couple of really key, important issues for property owners should the unfortunate event happen that an insurance claim needs to be submitted. So we want everybody to know a couple of key things. The first one is in the unfortunate event of a claim, we want you to document everything. Take pictures, take notes. Every time you talk to an insurance company, write it down, make a log. If unfortunately your shingles or your tiles flew off the roof, keep them. Photograph them while they're on the floor so that you can show where they fell. Put them in a bag, keep them in a corner of your garage somewhere. Don't discard them. It's going to be very important. Um, if you have any other damage where you need to remove parts of the property because they got waterlogged, they got damaged, keep them. Put them in a bag, put them aside, don't discard anything until you let the insurance company have an opportunity to inspect it. And the third tip is we don't want you to assume that the insurance, com insurance company's first offer is the final offer. They may send you a check, but that's not going to be their final offer. We want you to get what you're due and what's just for you. Even if you get paid, and if you feel it's not enough, give us a call. We can definitely help you get more money. The point is, you need to get enough money to fix your property, not enough money for your insurance company to be happy with what they're doing. So that's what we're here for. We can help you make the claim. We can help you go through the process of the claim. And if it becomes necessary and we have to go to litigation, we are qualified attorneys. We are able to go straight into the litigation process. And it's all one uh, streamlined process with our office. Either way, no matter if it's a storm, a leak, or a hurricane, you're better served by having a qualified attorney helping you from the beginning because we know the deadlines. There are statutory deadlines, there are things that the insurance company has to do on a specific time, and we are able to put that pressure on them from the beginning. You have to do this at this point in time, you have to do this, if not, we're gonna file suit. And because you're with us, we're able to jump, like I said earlier, right into the litigation, so it, it streamlines the process. It can still take a while, but it's still faster to go with us. Um, it, it's impossible to tell you how your particular case is going to go, but we've had cases who got res which get resolved in seven days. Unfortunately, some cases take over a year. So, it, on average, you're still going to be looking at at least half a year to a year uh, to get a resolution, but it is possible to get it done quicker depending on who's helping you. So again, very important to get somebody who's qualified and who knows the process. And, and to build off of that, Jamil, is 
to engage a lawyer or professional sooner rather than later because every time you make uh, contact with the insurance company, you may be putting yourself at risk with saying something that you didn't even know was incorrect to tell the insurance company. You're in an emotional state when something happens to your property and naturally uh, you just want to get it fixed as soon as possible and you may be saying things that you shouldn't be saying to the insurance company. So to engage a lawyer sooner rather than later is, is a good policy. You can reach us on our website at flplg.com, the Central Florida Professional Law Group. We can also reach us on our phone at 954-284-0900. We are a boutique firm that only does insurance litigation. So we know when you're calling us, we know that this is a priority for you. We're going to answer your call. We're going to get things moving immediately. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hurricane Preparedness event here in the city of Dania Beach, Florida, where everyone's learning all about being safe during a hurricane and doing the right thing so that you stay healthy and you feel good and nothing happens to your amazing home. Because we do live in paradise. We just love Florida. Have a great day. Stay safe and pay close attention to what you should do to stay safe and, and take care of your home and yourself and your pets and your children during this hurricane season. Have a great day. This is Oopsie the Wonder Clown. Good morning, my name is Jim Silvernail. I'm the president of the Dania Beach Lions Club. We're here this morning at the uh, Dania Beach Hurricane Expo. We are now into hurricane season and we have to be prepared. As individuals, we all have to take care of our own homes, but we have to take care of each other in our communities. So as president of Lions Club, we're a service organization here to help the community uh, provide hearing and vision impaired, basically, but uh, doesn't matter what the event is, the Lions Club's always there. If there's a need, there's a lion. When there is a hurricane, listen to what's going on. It's important. I was born and raised here, and I know that you have to be prepared, not only with your house, but with your family, and make sure your pets and everything that's inside comes, everything outside comes inside. And it's so important to listen to our people in the news media and our elected officials of what's happening uh, so we all can be safe. Material things can be replaced, but uh, life is very precious. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out for our fifth annual Hurricane Expo Code Red. We really appreciate all of you and the support. I wanted to thank everybody for coming to this event. This is really a very important event to us. You know, the most important thing uh, we do in government is uh, public safety, protect our residents. And uh, typically, we're involved with prevention. If you talk to police or fire or building prevention, you try to prevent problems. And then you, you, the ones that, uh, after the prevention, is planning for the problems and dealing with them when they do occur. Unfortunately, hurricanes you can't prevent. And, and they're coming. And we need to be prepared. Standing outside, and I looked up at some of these nice paintings around the building. And number 21 and 22 are right here in front of the commission chambers. And it just reminded me they're, they're of wolves. They're very nice. But it occurred to me that we've been learning about hurricanes our entire lives. And you've been hearing your whole life uh, about the need to prepare for hurricanes. And if you remember the fairy tale about the, the wolf and the three pigs, if you aren't prepared for the wolf when the wolf comes, the wolf is going to blow your house down and he's going to devour you. And that's really the way hurricanes are. You need to have the, be in a safe structure, have your awnings up, and be fully prepared for a hurricane when it occurs. So that's what we're here for, to help you. You know, the, uh, the three little pigs didn't have cell phones. I've got to tell you, if, if uh, you get Irma coming again or a big hurricane and you pick up the phone to call 911, there is nobody to answer your call. So after hurricanes occur, there's a, a period where it is, uh, you need to be able to prepare and take care of yourselves for days, literally days. Don't count on government to be there for you. It's not like a normal call to the police or to the fire department. You have to be prepared to take care of yourself for days. Hello, Dania Beach and surrounding communities. This is absolutely fantastic. First of all, I want to thank the Dania Beach Chamber of Commerce, along with the city of Dania Beach, 
uh, first responders for putting this expo together. This is just awesome. If you have not had the opportunity to go to each one of the vendors, please do so because there's so much knowledge and so much that they can share with you to keep us safe. As we're approaching the hurricane season after the last nine months, I, I looked at my cabinets and I said to my husband, well, we got all this stuff left over from the last hurricane. I guess we need to start eating it up so that we can start working on what we're going to do for the hurricane season this year. One thing that I learned about last year, it gave me an opportunity not only to help make our residents safe, but it gave me a chance to be out there and be a part of. I never thought that you would see me out there uh, lifting sandbags and and help taking to the, the residents' homes and making sure that we had plywood for our seniors, making sure that it was being put up. Uh, the water that we distributed to all, all of our seniors to make sure that they had adequate water supply. These were all things that we do in the city of Daniel Beach. So it gave me an opportunity to be out there. And I actually, working with Public Works, the uh, palms that were blowing in the streets, picking them up, putting them on the side, giving Brad a phone call, letting them know exactly where they were so he would be able to come out with his staff and pick them up, and making sure after the hurricane that we went back to all of those seniors that we helped put up the plywood to help take it down and make sure that they had the adequate uh, water supplies that they need. And I really think uh, all of the commission for making sure that we had food, especially Dania Point, they went out and they purchased food for the residents of the city of Daniel Beach because some of us were without power for a couple of days afterwards to make sure that they had something to eat. So this is what we do. And it starts right here today with what we're doing to educate you on how important it is to start working on your supplies now. Now I understand that until up until Thursday that you will be able to go and get your supplies and there will be no taxes. So if you are at that point that you need to get flashlights, you need to get first aid kits, whatever you need to get, you need to start working on it now. Go up until Thursday, the governor has said that uh, there will be no taxes. I thank you so much. I thank the city of Daniel Beach for all that you do to keep us safe. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today. Uh, I think we did a good job showing everybody what we're doing to try to prepare our residents uh, for hurricane season. Uh, we, we've worked very, very hard to try to establish uh, in our community safety and, um, and whatever it takes to make things work for us. I have to commend, uh, uh, you know, piggybacking on what Bobby said, I saw more, you know, it's funny how people all come together when we have a, a catastrophic event like Hurricane Irma. Uh, people were out there that neighbors I saw that I was working with that uh, were putting up shutters on people's houses, uh, offering food, offer a drink uh, and doing certain things and they didn't even know their, the neighbors names now they do also when we got done they were out there cutting trees cleaning up and uh, and I have to tell you our public works department uh, was on top of it I don't know whether you know it or not but Dania Beach was probably if it wasn't the first city cleaned up it was awful close to being the first city cleaned up and you may not all of you may not have gotten the, the first day service or second day, but I have to tell you there was so much debris in this in the state of Florida that it, um, it took everybody forever. People are still cleaning up as you see on the news and the keys. Um, so I have to commend our public works department uh, for everything they did and the, the fine job they did. Um, you know, as, as we all know too, that uh, things that I've been working with, uh, I brought up to the city manager's attention, uh, you know, we need to do something about our Dania Beach before we're not called Dania Beach anymore. And uh, hopefully that we can work with the city commission to figure out a way uh, to replenish our beach before the, uh, the government's supposed to come in in 2020. But you know how that works. So um, if we, uh, we can work together as a community to try to rebuild our beach, uh, where everybody likes to come, our tourists, our residents, uh, we would like to get something in order. But I do want to uh, thank the city of Dania Beach for putting this on today. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I was actually thinking Robert was gonna go first and talk about the forecast coming up for the hurricane season. Everything we do on TV 
that you see on NBC6, he's the one who's feeding us every piece of information that's coming in uh, about, well, it, it could be any type of weather, but when we're talking about like last weekend, every time he sent out a briefing, it was like our Bible of what to talk about on TV, all the, the flooding threats, the tornado threat. Um, so he's gonna speak after me, I guess, but uh, I wanna say thank you because uh, I can't do what I do without you doing what you do, so thank you. Um, so when I was first asked to speak, I um, am very flattered, and, but I thought, uh, I don't know if I'm qualified to speak. Brian Norcross from last year, he was here, and as I was watching, I realized, uh, first of all, Brian's amazing. He truly is uh, an expert on tropical weather, especially having lived through and covered Andrew, and he was here for the 25th anniversary. But what I, I, I got uh, was some inspiration on what I would talk about. All of the things that Brian talked about last year, he was doing because of the 25th anniversary of Andrew without knowing that just a few months later, Irma was going to hit. So I wanted to look at all of the things he talked about that changed in 25 years and see how we can apply those to what we learned during Irma. Um, just a, a brief little history of, of myself before I do that. Um, I did grow up in New Jersey. Uh, uh, when I started my career, I wanted to live in three parts of the country, somewhere where I could study uh, winter weather, which was basically where I grew up, where I went to school, uh, somewhere where I could study severe weather. So I spent six years in Dallas at the NBC station there, and I wanted to study tropical weather, which is why I moved to Miami. I also have family that lives here, so uh, this was like a perfect fit for me. Um, but, but I had no idea that when I came to uh, Miami that less than a year later we would have one of our biggest weather events ever uh, and I got to live through it as a broadcaster and um, I'm, I'm still to this day fascinated by the whole process the two weeks leading up to the storm what we knew a couple of days before the storm and and frankly how brilliant the forecast was not my forecast not not NBC 6 the all of the predictions from the National Hurricane Center of the storm a week before it made landfall, a day before it made landfall. Uh, Robert and I were talking about, in the greater scheme of things, if Florida is this tiny little speck of sand on the beach that is the earth, the forecast for Irma was brilliant. I mean, it was perfect, or almost perfect. Now, if you live in Florida, the difference between living on the west coast and the east coast is tremendous. And I remember the day before the storm, we didn't know if it was gonna go right over Key West. At one point it looked like it might hug the East Coast and then we were really uh, trying to home in on the West Coast because we knew, okay, it's probably gonna be more of a Key West, Naples, Fort Myers, Tampa. Um, amazingly, the storm went nowhere near Jacksonville and Jacksonville had some of their worst flooding ever. Amazingly, Tampa almost had one of their worst floods ever, and they, they actually got spared at the last minute. But the forecast was so brilliant, um, and it was just amazing to watch that and go on TV with all of this confidence that we knew where the storm was gonna go within about 50 miles in either direction, and then the day of, we knew within about 10 or 20 miles. And that, that makes talking about it on TV really easy because the National Hurricane Center's forecasts were so brilliant. Um, so let me just go through a couple of things that uh, that Brian talked about last year, and let's see how we can um, apply those to what happened just a few months later with Irma. Um, one of the most positive things that Brian talked about that changed between Andrew and uh, 25 years later, which was last year, is that forecast tracks are much better, they're more sophisticated, we have better computer models, we have more data, we, um, we, can, we can look at a storm two weeks before it makes landfall and identify it as a storm that might eventually make landfall. Uh, back when Andrew happened, yes, we had models, but they weren't as sophisticated and they weren't as reliable. And Brian said, now with the tracks much better, um, you know, we, can, we can predict a storm uh, with much more certainty and absolutely, 100%, we can say, you can apply that to Irma, and Brian was absolutely right about the storm that he didn't know was gonna happen yet. 
Um, one of the things he said that was worse is the flip side, too much confidence in a forecast. Uh, people think, oh, the weatherman said it, it's gonna be true. Well, not everyone thinks that. Some people don't think that about weathermen, which is fine. But, other, but when we look at a forecast, a lot of people say, oh, they said the storm's gonna hit uh, Miami, Miami Beach. I'm fine, I'm gonna drive to Naples. As we learned last year, you know, that the difference between Naples and Orlando or Naples and South Beach was tremendous. Um, and some people had too much confidence in the forecast until we, uh, until we had confidence. We told people, if you're gonna go to Naples, please make sure you stay tuned because you might have to take another road trip to the East Coast if we're gonna have a Naples landfall, which is exactly what happened. Um, Robert and I were talking about Nobody has transistor radios anymore. Nobody has TVs that run on batteries. Um, nobody has landlines for phones. Some people do, but all of these things back when Andrew happened were actually positive things because we didn't have as much technology. Now people rely on their iPhones and their iPads and if your battery runs out, that's a big problem. Um, so in that, in that sense, things we, actually, we saw that play out in Irma. People, uh, once their iPhone batteries died, they had no connection to the world. Um, and, and I just love that Brian talked about that. Um, by the way, I'm not trying to plagiarize Brian's speech. Uh, he, these are all just amazing things that he brought up that I thought I would address. Um, he also addressed the fact that uh, television stations back in 1992 were much bigger. We had bigger staffs. We had. Um, we had a lot more people. Last year, I was so proud of the work that we did at NBC6, and frankly, all of the stations did with very limited resources. At our station, we have people that speak two languages, and they'll do a report for NBC6, and then they'll do a report for Telemundo 51. Um, so we have you know, half the amount of people, and le last year, we had reporters going all over the, the area, from Key West to Tampa. Uh, and I'm so proud of the work that they did, but Brian did talk about that, that the television staffing in 1992 was so much more than it is now. Um, we just don't have as many people on TV to talk about the weather. Um, let's see, what are some of the other things he talked about? Um, so, uh, the, um, I, I'm not gonna take uh, too much time because um, Robert is going to talk. Uh, but I did want to say this, and this is uh, what, I, uh, what I wanted to take from Brian's speech last year and what I would have said if Brian didn't say it, but it's just some of the things that people should know now, not the week before a storm hits. Um, number one, some of the things that can go wrong. You don't have enough gas in your car. That's an easy one. Cars can get wrecked if they're parked in a bad spot. If you have to travel, you might not have enough gas. So if you're preparing for a storm, extra gasoline or enough gasoline in your car that's going to be able to you know, last for a few days if you can't get to a gas station. Um, communications. You know, Brian last year recommended everyone get a small portable TV that has batteries. Um, you might not have to use it ever, but it, it's one of those things that's probably great to have. He also talked about um, that batteries are more sophisticated than they were back when Andrew was around, and most electronics don't require as much battery power as before. You don't have to light candles all around your home. You can have very inexpensive LED lights around your house that last for days and weeks. Um, so a couple of those things to consider. Um, the things that have directly to do with the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center, the government communication last year and the communication between the local, state, and federal level, from my view in Irma, was outstanding. Whether you're talking about here in Dania Beach, or the places along Biscayne Bay, or Key West. I mean, we evacuated Key West four days before the storm, safely, and, and uh, it saved hundreds, thousands of lives. Um, we knew, uh, we, we did interviews with, you know, the National Hurricane Center, at least once an hour for 72 straight hours. Uh, we had them on TV telling us everything they needed to know. I, I, I know from talking to people here, emergency management here was absolutely amazing. Uh, that's a big change from when Andrew hit. It, it's just when Andrew hit, it was in some cases chaos. Um, there's, there's one last thing that I would like to say. Uh, 
and, and it has to do with where you live, Dania Beach. Um, the, most, the, the thing that people ask me about the most, if I could give one piece of advice, one thing that I think everyone should listen to, from my, from my opinion, when you're told to evacuate, please evacuate. And a mandatory evacuation still doesn't mean you have to leave your home. You can't be forced to leave your home. But if there's a mandatory evacuation and you're stranded, someone else has to come in and risk their life to save yours. And that person might not even be available to do it. Um, when people are told to evacuate, uh, y you know, just evacuate. Get enough gasoline, get enough battery power. If it's possible, find some place to go. Um, because when people don't listen to the evacuation orders, especially along the shoreline where we live, um, not only do you put your own life at risk, but you put someone else's life at risk um, as well if they have to try to uh, come and save you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. These events uh, are, I think, are outstanding. Uh, whenever we're invited to be a part of these, uh, I mean, we, we, we embrace the opportunity because this is where, where it all starts, in my opinion. It's, we, it starts at the local, really starts at the individual level. Not just local, but individual. And from there, it spreads out to the community, and then it goes on from there. So you all being here to uh, hear us speak, but really most importantly, to get the information that you need to be ready for this hurricane season is, is really critical. And so I thank the city of Dania Beach for having us again this year. I'd like to thank you. Thanks, Steve, for your kind words. And, and by the way, look, this, and, I, and I'm not just deflecting the praise here. This is true from all my experience. Uh, the, it's a team effort. It really is. When it comes to informing the public and warning the public of weather, for weather events or what could happen or what maybe just happened, it involves everyone doing their jobs at different levels. So it's National Weather Service, it's the, our media partners who do a great job of amplifying the message. You know, they, they by the way, meteorologists, you know, meteorologists at TV stations, they, they're, they study, they have the same uh, background as I do as a, as a weather service meteorologist. So they, they do their own forecast. They analyze, you know, the weather. And, you know, we do communicate quite a bit. You know, so it's, you know, we provide the, the general information and then they interpret it and they communicate the information that's, that's such an important, vital part of the process. Uh, and of course, our city and county officials, they are also in heavily or you know, greatly involved in a lot of the briefings that we provide. And then they take that information and make critical decisions. So you can see, you know, it's, you hear sometimes in the analogy to the three-legged stool, you know, the, in, the so it's a local city officials, county officials, state officials, media, and the National Weather Service, we all have to work together all to make, to, so that stool stays up, you know, so it doesn't fall apart. One of those falls apart, it's the system breaks down. So, and I think we're very fortunate here in South Florida, and really in the state in general, to have uh, good, really, experts in each of those areas. So I think really, we, we, it's not something that we should take for granted. We should be, certainly be thankful of that. So anyway, with that, uh, let's let's jump into the hurricane outlook for this year. This is the outlook that NOAA released uh, actually a little over a week ago now. So certainly, you know, I want you to look at those numbers and put it in perspective, right? The, those numbers that you see there, the number of the range of number of named storms is expected this season from those number of hurricanes, and then from those the number of potential major hurricanes. That's relative to the normal that we see. In other words, the averages for a given year for based on over 100 years of, of data. So the averages are 12 named storms, six hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. So if you relate it to that, those, are, those numbers are reflective of a near to above normal season. So that the, the chances are uh, the likelihood that we're gonna have near to above normal number of storms this hurricane season. And it's based on a variety of factors that they look at. One of the factors they look at is sea surface temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, right now, in the tropics, actually, the, the ocean's running a little bit cooler than normal, which, if that were to persist, if, so that's a big if, then that would be one thing in our favor. It would, it, would, it would contribute to perhaps lowering the number of storms. But there's more than just ocean temperatures. We look at um, 
We look at the uh, winds aloft. We look at the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of things we have to look at. Bottom line is this right here. Those outlooks are not landfall forecasts. We really have no skill or very, I would say very little skill in confidently saying which areas are more likely to be impacted in a given season, especially when we're still in early June and the tropics are quiet. So they're only broad and general indicators of how much activity we could expect in general, again, over a large area from Africa all the way to the United States. Those are you know, thousands and thousands of miles, and as Steve said, we're just a speck in, in, that, in, in, that, in that whole area. So you know, don't, don't use this outlook as a guide, and I don't think anyone here is. We're here because we're taking this threat seriously, right? We're taking, not the threat, but we're taking hurricane season, hurricane preparedness seriously. So again, we, can, we need to put those outlooks in perspective. Here are the names for the season. Everyone loves to, to see what the names are, and of course we can now cross Alberta off the list. So the next one coming up would be Beryl, and then from there on. Hopefully we won't get too far down the list. Hopefully we, we won't even get to the second column, but odds are we probably will. Hopefully we won't get to the third one. Let's just hope we don't get to the third column. So the past two seasons, and those of us that have been here uh, at least the last two years, you know, th they've reminded us that South Florida is hurricane country. You know, we are a part of the world or a part of the country that's extremely prone or highly prone to being hit by by hurricanes, or at least be threatened by hurricanes. Not, all, not every year, fortunately, but many years. Now, the last two years especially, we've had some pretty close calls. Matthew in 2016, and more notably, Irma last year. Now, both hurricanes, Matthew and Irma, passed about the same distance. When we were talking, we were talking about the center of the storm, they passed about the same distance from South Florida, about 95 miles or so. But we know that they had different, totally different impacts. Uh, those are the radar images from both storms. By the way, these images are courtesy of Brian McNoldy. He's a uh, graduate student at the University of Miami. He does a really great job of uh, compiling some, some really, uh, some, some great graphics that really do a great job of conveying the message. And I think the message here is that both of these hurricanes were similar intensity. They were both category threes. Matthew was east of us, Irma was west of us. But there's a big difference in what we experienced from both storms, right? Matthew, we had, we had some tropical storm force winds and gusts, but really not, not really all that much otherwise. Irma, on the other hand, certainly got a lot more from. Now, Irma was not a direct hit in southeast Florida, but it certainly was very close, as Steve mentioned. So we had, essentially, here in Dania Beach and really Broward County in general, sustained long period tropical storm force winds. In other words, pretty steady winds that were at tropical storm force level. Those are winds between 40 and 70 miles an hour. So, you know, at first glance, they may, that might not seem like a lot. Eh, it's 50 mile an hour winds. Of course, compared to 150, certainly it's not a whole lot. But when you take it, you know, on its own, 50, 60, 70 mile an hour winds blowing for several hours is going to do quite a bit of damage. On top of that, we had wind gusts or short bursts of wind, three, five seconds in duration, that occurred f quite often over a, maybe a four, six hour period that were as high as 90 miles an hour here in, in, in eastern Broward County, right, on, you know, right near the coast. So we had really, we had category one hurricane winds for a fairly long period of time, at least in gusts. So what we got from Irma was certainly, you know, certainly uh, notable and certainly we noticed the impacts that we we experienced. And of course, we all, I don't think I need to remind anyone of what, we, what, the, what the impacts were. A lot of tree damage, and that's typical of a category one type of storm where, you, where most of the damage, or the vast majority of it, is landscaping, trees. Of course, when trees are damaged, we have power outages. And we so certainly saw a lot of that. So again, this is uh, one of the many reminders that you know, any hurricane, any tropical system affecting our area is going to have an impact, and we just need, we need to be ready for those and take those seriously. You know, the day after, of course, most of, the, most of us were still without power. Four days later, southeast Florida was beginning to recover, but there were still other parts of the state that were still uh, without power and without power for several more days. Now, here in Dania Beach, 
storm surge is a big, so we're something big that we have to be uh, mindful of. And in a direct landfalling hurricane, it's a big concern. Uh, with Irma, given that the center of the storm passed about 90 miles from us and we didn't get the strongest winds, the storm surge, fortunately, was not as bad as it could have been. So we ended up getting with about three, ended up with about three feet of storm surge here in coastal Broward County. It could have been at least twice as much had Irma passed even 30, 40 miles closer, which, as yeah, Steve mentioned earlier, that's not much, that's very, very slight shift. And that shift could have easily occurred even as early as that morning of. So twice as much doesn't translate to twice as bad as far as impacts. It would have been more than twice as bad because that water, the, the water that moves on shore, this is a picture from up the coast, just up the coast in Fort Lauderdale Beach. That water, the storm surge water, it doesn't just sit there. It's not like the rainfall water, you know, when you get flooding from rainfall, it just kind of sits there, which is still bad, but it's not moving too fast. Storm surge is moving. That water is, it's basically like you're transporting the beach inland and that water has, moves with a lot of power, with a lot of force. The waves on top are breaking and crashing on shore and hitting buildings. And, you know, that's the worry. That's the concern with storm surge. So the storm surge warnings were issued. And by the way, we started issuing storm surge warnings last year for the first time. And it certainly, you know, we had to put it to use uh, quite a bit last year. And those storm surge warnings were issued for the threat or for the danger of life-threatening inundation. Again, we came pretty close here to having a really life-threatening situation. So, you know, those of you that evacuated, that first of all, those of you that live in evacuation zones here in Dania Beach or anywhere in, in the county and, and evacuated, you made the right decision. Let me, let me emphasize that. You made the right decision because it was close to being something pretty bad for us, especially right along the beach, right along the coastline. And this, again, I'm not going to go over this in much detail, but uh, east of US-1, those are the evacuation zones in Broward County. So if you live east of US-1, certainly including the Barrier Island, you are in an evacuation zone, and those evacuation zones were uh, implemented last year for, for Irma. Those, those evacuation zones are based on storm surge, based on the threat of storm surge, based on elevation studies that are done and running those storm surge models that simulate what the surge could be for storms of different categories, different wind speeds. So those are the areas that are most at risk, that are most vulnerable from storm surge. Now, in mobile homes also can be ordered to evacuate because of the wind. But of course, they're much more susceptible to wind damage than your typical South Florida uh, building or structure. So Irma and all the tropical systems that affect this are reminders that these systems or these storms are multi-hazard impact events. In other words, it's more than just about the wind. It's also about the water and flooding and even tornadoes and outer rain bands that affected us during Irma and, and many other tropical systems as well. I'm gonna talk for a few minutes here before I wrap up about some of the, some of the things that we often see, you know, that we often look at and keep close track of uh, during a uh, big weather event. Well, especially, well, of course, we're fo focusing on hurricanes here. I'm sure a lot of you or all of you watch, like to uh, track the cone and the forecast track, right? We have a lot of cone watchers here. And that, that's fine. That, that's good. That, that, hey, we, we, we put it out. There's a reason for it. So the, the cone is good as far as giving you a general idea as to where the center of the storm is most likely to be during that forecast period. But the cone only represents the potential or the likely location of the center of the storm, the center of the storm, not necessarily where the impacts or the worst of the weather or where the weather itself is going to be. So in the cone also, with time, gets smaller. Our forecasts, you know, the, the, our, our forecasts keep on improving from, from year to year. I mean, we, we keep statistics on our forecast errors and as far as the track is concerned, or where a storm is expected to go, our forecasts get better and better. Our, the errors get smaller. So with that, the cone itself gets smaller. So the cone is a reflection of our forecast skill and where it's most likely, based on our past forecast skill, where that storm is 
will likely end up being, where the center of the storm will likely end up falling. So it's the same size for every storm, no matter how big or small that storm is, for any given season, that cone is the same exact size. So it's, just, it's a computer generated image or a computer generated product that draws that cone around that forecast track. So again, it does not represent the area of impact, the area that, you know, the areas that are, that are going to experience uh, those, you know, any, the, the impacts of the storm. So certainly when you're about five days out, it's good to use the cone to give you a general idea of where that storm might be or whether you might be affected by the storm. So if we're in that five-day cone, that's a good time to make sure that your hurricane supplies are in order. Of course, your hurricane plan should already be there, right? You should already have that plan. You should already have your supplies. But maybe you need to restock a little bit. That's a good time to do it. Once the storm gets really close to us, we're within about 24, 36 hours, the cone then starts to lose its significance because the impacts of the storm, in this case the wind field you see there around the storm, spreads out far away from the center. So the cone, as the cone gets smaller, the storm itself doesn't get smaller. Sometimes the storms get larger. They expand as they get closer to you. So don't, the, the moral of the story here is don't use the cone that precisely. Don't narrow it down to, well, the cone is now not over Danny Beach anymore, now it's over Weston. It, that doesn't really, you know, at that point, it's, it's irrelevant. You know, we're all expected to see, to get the impacts. If, even if we're somewhat close to that cone, when we get to that 24, 36 hour period. So don't use it to that level of detail. It's never, it was never intended to be used in that, in that sense. So really, it's, it's, it's very important, to, I think, to go beyond the cone. Use the cone, use that forecast track information, and go beyond it to get information on what we could expect. What are the local impacts that we could potentially experience and prepare for? So these graphics that I'm going to show here, just really quick, and then the website where you can get that information, go more directly to what you should be doing, what we should be preparing for, all of us that live here in South Florida. So we, we take all the different, uh, well, the, the four main threats with, with a storm, the wind, storm surge, flooding rain, and tornadoes, and we do threat assessments every six hours. So when the Hurricane Center puts out their advisory every six hours, we make a threat assessment, and we, and we, and we give it, uh, we assign it threat levels ranging from the yellow level, which is the lower level, to orange, to red, to purple, which is the highest level. So the higher the threat level, the more preparation we need to do for more, you know, potentially more serious conditions. So you can take a quick scan of those when, you, when we have a storm out there and it gives you a, a, a threat assessment. What is, the, what is the hazard of most concern? Maybe it's multiple hazards, like here. With Irma, we had the wind and the surge as our primary highest level hazards here in eastern Broward County and the appropriate levels that we should be prepared for. Now, with Irma, we were obviously very concerned about the potential for high devastating storm surge, as well as extreme level winds, or winds of category three or higher intensity. Even as late as, I'm sorry, even as late as that Friday, two days before, we were concerned about that. And that's what those graphics were reflecting. Those purple levels along the coast here were reflecting maximum level of threat from those two hazards. So why do, we, why do we reflect that and why do we, you know, in other words, are we taking the exact forecast track here? No, we're actually, we are taking the exact forecast track, but we're also taking into account potential variations in that forecast track. Steve, Steve mentioned it well earlier, you know, we, we can't over rely on that exact forecast track because even very slight changes can make a huge difference. So these graphics take into account those variations in the forecast track that could occur and then relate to you what is what we, what we call the reasonable worst case situation. Not the worst case situation, but the reasonable worst case situation given even a very slight shift in the forecast track. So I want you to remember that. You know, we, we, we have a lot of confidence in our forecasts, but we also understand that those forecasts that track can shift a little bit very easily. So if we don't over rely on the forecast track, of course, we don't want anyone else to either. 
So here's where you get our information any day of the year, every day, weather.gov slash South Florida. That's the website for the Miami Forecast Office. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, NWS Miami. So just to wrap up here, uh, our watches and warnings are the keys, okay, as far as what public response should be. So when we put out those watches and warnings, that's what we want you to really heed and pay attention to, those 48-hour time frames for watches in the 36 hour time frame for warnings. And it's based on the official forecast track and any of those slight variations that could occur, we have to take that into account to make sure that we are not underprepared, that we are prepared for basically what could happen if the storm takes a more uh, track or track closer to us. So understand your area, it's vulnerability. Here in Dania Beach, we have storm surge issues. We have flooding issues from rainfall. So make sure that you understand that and put it in the context of a hurricane situation. Stay abreast of official hurricane information. That's local media, such as NBC6, local officials, local. Remember that, local first. We, are, we understand the area. We know all the details. So get your information from local official sources. And of course, heed evacuation orders. Know whether you live in an evacuation zone, as I mentioned earlier, and if you do and you're ordered to evacuate, please do so. It will, as Steve said, in the Keys has saved thousands of lives. If it would have been a direct hit here, it would have saved thousands of lives here as well. We also don't want to, we want to avoid this, right, being trapped on traffic when fleeing a storm. So if possible, if, if at all possible and you have to evacuate, evacuate tens of miles, not hundreds of miles. Evacuate to maybe a friend or relative's house that lives just inland. That's the recommendation that emergency managers always uh, give out, and that's what we, certainly what we try to spread as well. So in conclusion, hurricane season's just begun. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So keep your pace. Don't get burned out too soon and then forget about it, especially when the season gets most active, which is typically August, September, and October. And yes, hurricanes can strike any year, even in relatively inactive years. So the seasonal outlook, even if we only have eight storms, one of those could hit us. We just have to be ready every single year. We need to take every storm threat seriously. Don't over rely on your past experience either. You know, I've been through several hurricanes myself, but every, I've learned that every hurricane is different. Every hurricane affects us in different ways. So don't use your past experience to say, oh, well, yeah, this storm looks like it's going to be like Irma or it's going to be like so-and-so. No, it might be totally different. More than likely, it will be totally different. So don't play that category game either. Don't assume that a category one is, is insignificant. It's not. We saw that from Irma. Thank you very much. We're here today to give you some basic tips on what to do and what not to do when the hurricane season comes now. We wanted to share with you the common mistakes that property owners tend to make when they have damage and they're working with the insurance company to file a claim. So the first mistake is not documenting what happened or not documenting fast enough or not documenting in general enough. Right, so as an attorney, I, rep I represent the clients, you, the homeowners, when they're being deposed or when they're being asked questions by the insurance company, and usually they ask them, well, how much water was there? And, they and they're like, I, I don't know, it was water all over the house. Well, what does that mean? Did it cover your ankles? Was it only a little bit? So the best thing you can do is take pictures. Most of us have smartphones now. Take a picture, do a video if you can. Um, document it all because when they ask you, you can tell, I don't remember, but I looked at my pictures and there was this much water. If you happen to have a tape measure, stick it in the water and take a picture of the tape measure showing just how much water there was. We actually had somebody come to our booth today and she was telling us about how she had coconuts that went right through her roof. Take a, Look up, take a picture of the hole in your roof, take a picture of the coconuts, and then put those coconuts aside, don't throw them out. And we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Uh, so basically you want to document everything. If it's, a, if it's a leak, where is the leak? How much water is coming? They're going to ask you, well, was it, was it gushing or was it a little slow drip? That's a question they always ask you. And most people don't remember because you're, you're scared, you're worried, and you just want to fix your house. Take a couple minutes, fix it, take a picture. If, especially if you can do a video of the amount of water, there's no question. And, and it's going to be crucial to getting you the proper result in, this, in your claim. And as part of documenting, we want you to write down every single conversation you have with the insurance company. Because guess what, they do. 
Every time they call you, they say when they talk to you, who spoke with you, what you said. You want to have that written down as well so that if they tell you, oh, you said this, you can look at your notes and you can point out whether you did or not. So document everything. Even if you think you're over-documenting, the more information you have, the better. The second mistake property owners tend to make is discarding materials from your damage. So the picture you see here is of a damaged roof. Well, in an effort to clean up our own property, we might want to quickly discard all the debris and the damage. Don't do that. Right. So one of the issues that most people come across, when, especially when it's a roof claim, they're going to tell you, well, no, this is an old roof. Those tiles fell off years ago. Those tiles broke years ago. Your shingles have been flying off for the last 10 years. Um, so the way you beat them at, that, at their own game, you take a photo of where they landed on your floor, on your garden, on your yard, then you bag them up, you put them in a bag, put them in a corner. At some point, they're going to want to see it. You have it, you do your due diligence, and they can now try to twist things around and tell you, oh, no, this has been damaged for a long time. And it comes back to the story of the coconut. Keep the coconut, whatever it is. Um, and one of the, the bigger ones is when you have a pipe leak, you call a plumber, the plumber fixes it, the plumber usually leaves you the broken pipe. A lot of people throw them out. You don't want to do that. You want to keep the pipe because the insurance company, if they did not get to inspect while it was actively leaking, they just have your word to go on it. And guess what? They don't believe you. They don't, they're not your friends. So you're going to want to have the broken pipe to show them. Here's the broken pipe. So keep the pipes. Keep anything that, that was damaged. If you have to cut a section of the wall, put it in a, brown, in a black bag in your garage and just store it there until they come to your house and they inspect it. Okay, mistake number three is assuming the insurance company's offer is final. Right, so a lot of people think, well, my insurance company is going to do what's best for me. They're my friends, they're there to help me, and they're not. That the whole business of insurance is to pay as little as possible so that they keep as much profit as possible. If they paid every claim, they will go bankrupt. So this is how, they, how it works. So essentially, even if you think you have a good company and wow, they wrote you a check for $10,000, that's probably not enough. So what you have to do, you have to you do your due diligence. You have to hire an expert. You have to hire professionals who can tell you what the actual damage to your property is. It may be $100,000. Most people don't know, but once you start removing, let's say, your ceiling, you have to remove your, your you have to start painting your driveway. If you got to do your driveway, you got to do your baseboards. If you're doing your baseboards, you have to paint. And so it starts adding up, and if you don't know, you're really selling yourself short. short. And it's important because after Irma, which is despicable, but a lot of these insurance companies started putting on their check full and final. That's not enforceable, that is not true. And on, by Florida law, they have to give you what's called an undisputed payment. That's all they're doing. You can get more money, we can help you with that. Don't assume just because you got a check that you're done. We wanna give you one final bonus mistake, and that is not getting help soon enough. Again, a lot of people think the insurance company is there to help you. Like I said, they're not. So when you call them and you think you're having a conversation with your buddy, with your friend, remember that they're analyzing every single thing you say and trying to find a way to turn that against you. And a lot of times, especially if it's a particularly bad damage to your house, you may be emotional, you may have lost something that means a lot to you, you may be scared for your safety. <clears throat> so you, you, you tell the insurance company, oh, this has been going on for a very long time, this is terrible, you gotta help me. In your mind, you, you think you said something good. They have to help you because it's been going on for a long time. But all they heard is, this has been going on for a long time. This is long-term damage. This is excluded under the policy. We win. So what we want you to do is, from the beginning, get a professional. Now, of course, we're here because we do this every day. We want you to choose us, but you don't have to choose us. But you need to get a professional. Don't think that you can do this on your own. Get a public adjuster, get an attorney. We are here to help you through the entire process. At the end of the day, if you could do it on your own, we most likely can do it better because this is all we do. What we want is we, we tell you what to tell them, what not to tell them. Obviously, you always say the truth, but there are different ways of saying the truth and ways in which you don't put yourself at risk, you don't lose your claim, you don't throw away what you could get. So it, it's very important that you seek out help from the very beginning. We are here to help you. And you know, hopefully nobody needs our help this um, storm season, but if you do, we're here to help. My name is Jesse O'Hara. I'm a litigation attorney that focuses, as to specializes in property damage litigation in uh, the tri-state or tri-county area. 
So the bulk of my clients are representing homeowners, but also companies that service homes. This is following a hurricane. Lots, there's plenty of hurricane damage here, but also not just hurricanes. If you have a pipe leak, for example, um, roof leak, mold issues, which are quite common, and, um, and the like, fire damage. And the, I used to represent insurance companies. I used to defend insurance companies, and I know the mindset. And I eventually switched sides because I didn't like the way that things were going. Um, what I would say is that most homeowners that I meet are pretty much clueless as to how much Florida law is on their side. Florida law very much heavily favors homeowners, and here's how it works. Essentially, you file a claim with your insurance company. From that time, they have 90 days to issue a decision on coverage. So they either pay or don't pay, okay? So if, if they pay out um, within the 90 days, that means they've issued a coverage decision. If they haven't paid, um, then on the 91st day, you can assume that your claim is denied and then a law firm can step in. If 90 days has passed since you filed the claim and you either weren't paid or you, didn't, or you weren't paid enough, it's virtually impossible to get the compensation that you're entitled to without the assistance of an attorney. If you'd like to go to, the, to, the, um, you, to your insurance company's building, knock on the door with your handout, by all means you can try, it's virtually impossible. So here's also what a lot of homeowners don't realize. And as I mentioned, a lot of our clients are companies that service homes. So when you have um, a pipe leak, for example, homeowners more often than, than not will call up a water mitigation company, they'll bring in their machines to suck up all the water, and they'll pay out of pocket. They'll keep their receipt, they'll submit it to their insurance company with the hope of being reimbursed. However, there's a lot of companies who will not charge the homeowner for these, for these services. They'll have you sign what's called an assignment of benefits. So they'll arrive at your home, they'll see that there's water damage, and instead of you paying out of pocket, you'll sign a document that just says, Instead of the, it, it's, it's called an assignment of benefits, those are your policy benefits. So instead of the insurance company paying you, and then you pay the water mitigation company or, or the mold remediation company, they just pay them directly and it makes it a lot easier. So um, the way that that works is um, we handle a lot of the, the cases um, on behalf of the, um, the, the, part, the companies that have the assignments of benefits. We also represent um, the homeowners. And um, if you have questions, by all means, uh, our, our booth is set up in the back there. Our firm, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we handle a variety of, of areas, uh, including personal injury. Um, but, I, but I specialize in the property damage claims, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, if you have questions, by all means, come and see me. I'm happy to help. Um, our firm uh, literally wrote the book on insurance. So when you have judges, uh, the legislature, for example, when they have questions on insurance in the state of Florida, they reference our books that we write um, and they are um, uh, renewed annually with new information whenever there are updates on Florida law. So that's why I think if you have uh, questions or property damage, come and see us. We're here to help and I could be reached anytime. Thank you. I'd like to thank all our sponsors, Bass Pro Shops, Florida Advocates, a private law firm, Florida Home Improvement Associates, Florida Professional Law Group, Florida Power and Light, Memorial Healthcare, Stellar Public Adjusting, Storm Tight Windows, and Waste Management. Uh, very busy here today. The, they did a great job uh, putting this expo together for the residents. And um, a lot of people that are here working and behind me, we have even volunteers from the schools here doing service hours to help out. It's a great community effort. We're all here preparing for the uh, hurricane season, uh, trying to get uh, everybody ready so we can uh, do the best we can under bad situations. Uh, and you know, just uh, other things that we have to worry about as well as preparing for hurricane season is to try to get our beaches back in shape. Uh, you know, we've had uh, some pretty bad storms and uh, right now, uh, working with the city manager, we are uh, trying to do something to uh, get our beach renourished. Uh, but that is uh, all the things that come into play when you have uh, tropical season around. So let's hope that we have a, a, a good season this year, that we can bypass any storms and uh, give us a chance to regroup. On the beach uh, renourishment, I've spoken to the city manager, and uh, he is working um, with us to maybe work with Broward County and go beyond that to uh, work you know, with the federal government if possible. If not, uh, we may have to uh, set some of our programs aside. I think it's very important 
for us to spend uh, the funds that we have allocated to other projects to, to make sure that we have a beach to provide for our tourists and our residents. Uh, without a beach, we won't be called Dania Beach. And right now, we're eroded back so bad from all the storms that we've had this year that we barely have anything left except for the dunes. Um, we are planning and hopefully going to at least rebuild the dunes and try to um, you know, put some beach back. Um, so I am actively, as of right now, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, this week I have made effort to work with the city manager and staff to um, prepare it for the city commission meetings uh, to uh, see if we can reallocate some funds and do some of this ourselves to get uh, Dania Beach back. Along with the beach renourishment that we were hoping for uh, sooner than later uh, was planned for the year 2020, but um, we can't really wait that long. Uh, there may be nothing left of Dania Beach in the roadways themselves. So uh, along with that, we're trying to obviously make things happen, but um, hopefully we'll get things done a little quicker because we can't wait till 2020. My name is Pat Tuckerman, and I am the chair of the Green Advisory Board for the city of Dania Beach. Our purpose is to educate our residents on the importance of recycling and leaving a smaller carbon footprint. We have these wonderful bags that were donated to us by Florida Power and Light to help with our outreach in the community. Please be sure, use our bags for your groceries. Take advantage of the programs that the city has when you want to get rid of medication. Don't throw them in your toilet and destroy our water supply. There are so many things that you can do to be a good citizen. We meet once a month on the third Wednesday of the month. The public is invited to come and see what we do and talk about ideas. So we will look forward to seeing you very soon. And remember, reuse and recycle. Just in case you didn't know, our new water plant is LEED certified. In the parking garage, there are places for you to plug in your car. Dania Beach really cares about becoming a completely green city. Join us in on those efforts. This is a great event that Dania Beach puts on every year to help their residents get ready for the hurricane season that has already started. It would be a really good idea for you to come out and join us at this event. We look forward to seeing you in the future. Isabella Delany and I, Oopsie the Clown, we're here to show you that we're do we've been painting the story of the Three Little Pigs. I don't know if you're aware, but the Three Little Pigs story is actually a real estate story. So the Three Little Pigs built a what? What was the first house built from? Out of straw. Do you think that would handle a hurricane? No way. Uh-uh. Where could you build a house out of straw? Does anyone know? Maybe. Nope. Nope. House of straw won't work. How about what, what did the second little pig build his house out of? Of sticks, and would that handle a hurricane? No, no, it would not handle a hurricane. Code enforcement would not like that at all to be building a house out of sticks. I don't even think you could get a permit to build a house out of sticks in Dania Beach. I don't think so. So, what did the third little pig build it out of? Bricks. So, see, ladies and gentlemen, having a house made out of bricks using all the safety codes that we have in our city of Dania Beach to keep you safe from a hurricane and from flooding and from wind, right, ladies and gentlemen? And so that your roof doesn't blow off and for you to be safe, be better than the three little pigs and build your house the right way and always obey code enforcement. Have a great day, bye. It does provide a lot of brochures and maps of Florida and a lot of the brochures have helpful tips on what to do, like how much water to pack for a certain amount of days and it's just important to learn about since now that climate change is becoming a bigger issue, more hurricane, more severe hurricanes at like categories four and five are going to start coming around. And so you want to make sure that you're prepared for that. Residents and non-residents, visitors and people who are just passing through for the day, come and see us at Friends of the Dania Beach at the Dania Beach Paul DeMeo Library. We have wonderful, robust programs for adults and children, June, July, August, all are free. And uh, quite a few things there for if you're in hurricane season and you need books to read, come and check them out. 
videos, come and check them out. Children's books, we've got them in our book nook and also in the library for checkout. And we have lots of things you can do online. Get your library card, which by the way, the new library card is publicizing Dania Beach. And if you weren't aware of it, it is the Dania Beach Pier. We are here to serve everyone. You don't have to be a Dania Beach resident to use our free programs. You don't need to be a Dania Beach resident to get a library card. And we're here. We're here for you all year long. We participate in all the city events, CRA events, Chamber of Commerce events, and we hold our own events. Everything that we do is free. We raise money to provide those free programs to everyone. So thank you. I'm thrilled to be here to represent the Daniel Beach Library. And this is a wonderful day for all those that come out and enjoy. I'm G-Man for G-Man Production. I'm the founder of G-Man Production, Art for Your Heart. So I make art on wood. And the uh, uh, funny thing is, a couple of months ago, I, learned, I heard uh, uh, the Mona Lisa was painted on wood. I said, that's cool. I said, the poplar, and I use a lot of poplar already. So that's it. I make a connection with uh, Mona Lisa. But my art is, uh, uh, is all kind of media. It's all set in acrylic. I use uh, glass, broken glass, sand, different color. Uh, sand from, not sand, different color, yeah. And, uh, uh, sea glass from Hollywood Beach. Uh, oh my God, you can name it. Welding, metal, wood, different color, textures. It's like, when I go in my garage, I never know what I'm gonna make. But it's always a theme of spread the hope, love, peace, and happiness. For me in particular, Hurricane Expo was very helpful regarding my animals. I was a little worried about what to do, I've always been worried about what to do with my animals. And the Humane Society was here and the Red Cross was here. And they were both giving me helpful hints and information. And I did not know to register my animals with the Humane Society having to do with hurricane planning. I, I had no idea. So th that was probably my biggest learning today.